the odds say that I will one day be laying in a bed unable to move a muscle. Former Tennessee Titan Tim Shaw and his battle with ALS. The ice bucket challenge that fired him up. An amazing feeling to have those guys stand up with me was awesome. And the faith that gives him his fearless spirit. ALS doesn't define me. Well, we welcome you to this edition of the 700 Club. Just one week from today, Americans across this land will go to the polls. They may deliver a stinging rebuke to President Obama by voting Democrats out of office and giving Republicans control of the Senate. Many of the key races are still too close to call, and it all may come down to who shows up to vote. Dale Hurd has the story. <laughs> Polls show control of the U.S. Senate is coming down to the proverbial wire, with Democrats and Republicans locked in tight races in key contests in Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Arkansas, and North Carolina. In Iowa, Republican Jody Ernst has a three-point lead over Democrat Bruce Braley with ads like this one. I grew up castrating hogs on an Iowa farm, so when I get to Washington, I'll know how to cut pork. Washington's full of big spenders. Let's make them squeal. A new CNN poll shows that 7 out of 10 Americans are angry at the direction the country is headed, and 53 percent disapprove of the president's job performance. In the Senate, Republicans need a net gain of only six seats. Well, I think we will hold the Senate. You know, I know all the pundits are saying Republicans will take the Senate. Democrats are going to prove the pundits wrong on Election Day when we keep the Senate. This is going to be a good year for Republicans. Mm -hmm. It's a good environment for us. Uh, Luke talked earlier about the incompetence that some people feel about the Obama administration. I mean, that's catching up to them. Some candidates are touting their military service, while others want voters to know they can handle a gun. It's going to come down to who shows up on Election Day and who stays home. Evangelicals, millennials, blacks, Hispanics. CBN News political editor John Wonky. You know, if the Democrats use their micro targeting uh, system that they have, then they can keep some of these races close and maybe even keep the Republicans from taking the Senate. But Republicans have the sentiment, the anti Obama feeling, uh, the feeling that the country's on the wrong track, and that is their ace in the hole going into Tuesday. Polls may make projections. But the only poll that counts is on Election Day. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, we're going to have a special uh, coverage uh, of the 700 Club and also online. You can be watching uh, what's happening and getting uh, updates on our election coverage on CBNNews.com, including alerts with news app and emails. Our reporters will be posting on Facebook and Twitter. Coverage on election night will start at 7 p.m. in other news. Uh, we will not focus too much on our election, but it, if whatever's happening in the world is going to impact very strongly our attitude toward the president. While the world is focused on the fight against ISIS, Israel has been warning that there's a much more dangerous long-term threat in the Middle East. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. Pat, as you mentioned, the U.S. and its allies have been launching limited attacks on the U.S. Meanwhile, Iran has been working on its nuclear program uninterrupted. And as Chris Mitchell reports, Israel worries the international negotiations on the nuclear program may end up producing a bad deal. For the first time in years, much of the world and many Arab countries appear unified, this time against ISIS terrorists. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, however, continues to sound the alarm over the danger of a nuclear Iran. ISIS must be defeated. But to defeat ISIS and leave Iran as a threshold nuclear power is to win the battle and lose the war. Netanyahu and other Israeli officials warn that Iran's nuclear program is what keeps them up at night. One official said that ISIS is a five-year problem, but Iran is a 50-year problem. And I am here to tell you that Israel is deeply concerned. That concern, according to Intelligence Minister Yuval Steinitz, is about negotiations over Iran's nuclear program. The Iranians have shown no real flexibility on the two main issues. 
the issue of the centrifuge facilities, uh, centrifuge for enrichment of uranium, and the heavy water reactor in Iraq. Steinitz also said Israel worries negotiators will end up with a bad deal. He maintains no deal is better than a bad deal. No deal means that you stand by your principle, that you are not giving up, that you are not sacrificing the future of the world, that you are not sacrificing global security, that you are not ready that what happened with North Korea will repeat itself after one or two or three years with Iran. And Middle East analyst Jonathan Spire comes back to the fight against ISIS and how it could ironically help Iran. So if it becomes the paramount or the sole goal of Western policy to destroy Sunni Islamism and Sunni jihadis in these areas, the effective result of that will be, by default, so to speak, to strengthen the enemies of those uh, forces, which are not democratic forces, they're pro-Iranian forces, the Shia Islamists align with Iran. So it's crucial to keep that bigger picture in mind, I think, if we are to avoid effectively strengthening or even absurdly acting in cooperation with our most dangerous enemies in the region. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Pat, just last week, a top Iranian official involved in those nuclear talks said Iran won't take any backward steps on its nuclear program. They recognize that we have a weak president, and <clears throat> the Saudis, <coughs> excuse me, the Saudis are doing what they can to take care of their own interests. They're joining with Egypt, joining with Kuwait, joining with the Emirates and behind the scenes joining with Israel as a coalition uh, to uh, stand against uh, Iran and also, of course, against ISIS. But uh, right now, the Israeli uh, uh, defense minister was here in Washington. Uh, the uh, vice president refused to meet with him. The secretary of state refused to meet with him. And uh, they're doing everything they can to stick their f eye, finger in the eye of our closest ally in the Middle East. And they have insulted over and over again. They have forced uh, the prime minister of Israel to make steps that he thought, thought uh, were, were unwise for his country, but he's done it to appease America. And now all of a sudden he says, look, I've had it with you guys, and we're not going to take it any longer. And he's making move that uh, is in direct contravention of advice from the White House because our allies no longer trust our president, John. Pat, Israel will move forward with plans to build in East Jerusalem. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu made that pledge in an address to Parliament Monday, and it comes despite pressure from the U.S. and other Western allies not to expand settlement construction. Israel is building about 1,000 housing units in the city, and Netanyahu said there's consensus to continue, just as every Israeli government has done since capturing East Jerusalem in 1967. That sector is home to the city's most sensitive holy sites. Palestinians want that part of Jerusalem to be their future capital, but Israel says Jerusalem as a, as a whole will forever be the Israeli capital. Well, here at home, the nurse who was forced into quarantine in New Jersey after treating Ebola patients in West Africa is now free. Casey Hickox called her forced isolation in a hospital tent inhumane. She's now considering suing the state of New Jersey. Maine officials want Hickox to remain in her house for 21 days until after her last possible exposure to the virus. Her attorney says states should follow federal health guidelines, which only require monitoring. Nine states now require 21-day quarantine for health care workers returning from the Ebola hot zone. And doctors of Army soldiers, along with their general, are being isolated at their base in Italy after serving in West Africa to help, fight with, against the, uh, to help the fight against Ebola. Pat? There again, you've got the schizophrenic leadership of our nation. They're telling states, look, you can't quarantine people. It's not the right way to go. Yet the Army is quarantining its people in Italy when they get back out of the hot zone. Uh, it's just because uh, we, we, we don't have any coherent policy. And the press aide of the president won't give a straight answer to what our policy is. And, um, you know, I, I heard something today that I thought was very uh, telling as well. Uh, a commentary on uh, our attitude toward uh, Islam. The president had said, ISIS is not truly Islamic. 
ISIS, the name is Islamic State in Syria or in the Levant. It isn't, and, and yet our president says, well, you say you're Islamic, but you really aren't. You say you're following Mohammed, but you really aren't. But they really are. And somehow uh, we have decided as our policy of our government, we're going to separate the ideology of Islam from the activity of these extremist groups and not realizing that the conduct of the extremist groups comes directly out of the commandments found in the Quran and in the Hadith. That's one more schizophrenic thing. It's small wonder their allies have no confidence in us. They don't know what we're doing, and they wonder because they realize what a great nation we are, and yet what bad leadership. John. Pat, the Islamic group Boko Haram has captured dozens more girls and young women in northeast Nigeria, according to people who've escaped from the area. The captives are forced to become Muslims, forced into marriage, and raped, and hopes of rescuing the 200 girls kidnapped earlier this year are fading. Gary Lane has that story. The Nigerian government recently raised hopes that a negotiated ceasefire with Boko Haram would lead to the release of the 219 kidnapped girls. Family members and advocates were optimistic. And we're still watch, watching. We're extremely anxious. But the ceasefire fell apart, and fighting with the Islamic terrorist group continues. Many people now believe all the girls may never be recovered. Do you think they have the girls from Chibok, or have they sold them into slavery? We're not sure that Boko Haram is even capable of retrieving the girls that they are promising to release to the government at the moment. So uh, there's a mixture. I th believe they married some off to their own uh, warlords and uh, have scattered some of them uh, far across the region. Nigeria analyst Peyi Soyinka Arawele confirms that some of the kidnapped girls have actually been used in suicide bomb attacks. And she says if some girls are freed, they may not be the girls who were kidnapped last April in Chibok. They have continued abducting more women over the past few days since the ceasefire was announced. And it is believed by some observers in the villages that the Boko Haram only intend to release the new victims that they have recently abducted and not the girls from Chibok. 276 schoolgirls, many of them Christians, were kidnapped at their boarding school. 57 eventually escaped from captivity. An international outcry ensued over the kidnappings. Demonstrations like this one called hashtag bring back our girls went viral on the internet and worldwide. President Obama was even moved to take action. He sent a team of security advisors to Nigeria to help the rescue effort. But Professor Arawele says many Nigerians believe their military is incapable of defeating Boko Haram, despite U.S. assistance. The military certainly is floundering, it is struggling, has not been very successful. Even on the day that the ceasefire was announced, towns were attacked, people were killed and flags were hoisted by Boko Haram. And Ms. Arawele says the Nigerian army alone cannot defeat Islamic extremism. She suggests before change can take place, progressives and Muslims must admit religion plays a role in the violence. Those who are Muslims today um, might have to do some critical uh, self-assessment of the reality of how the faith is being utilized um, to wage war against their fellow citizens. And after waiting for a half year, the families of the girls now grow impatient, hoping and praying for a breakthrough that will finally bring back their girls. Gary Lane, CBN News. And of course, we echo those prayers for their safe return. Pat? You know, I hate to sound bellicose, but some years ago, there was an organization called Executive Solutions made primarily, uh, made up primarily of South African warriors, fighters, trained military men. There was a situation in Sierra Leone of uh, chaos, rebellion, and a small group of rebels was terrorizing the country. Executive Solution went in there and just moved through. They were expert fighters and brilliant marksmen, and they just killed those people as fast as they could kill them. And the whole rebellion collapsed, and the country went back to peace. But because it was South Africans involved, the uh, uh, rulers in, in the other countries said, well, we can't have, 
white South Africans coming in this way. We've got to tell them to stand down, and so they did. But they need something like that in this Boko Haram. It's a small group of people, and they're terrorizing the biggest nation on Africa, in Africa. And what's got to be done, I know this sounds terrible, is they've got to go in there and kill those people because they will kill others. They are murdering thugs, and they need to be put down, and they need to be put down with force of people who know how to fight. We have fighters. We have the Delta Force, and we have the SEALs, and we have others, but I don't think America is going to send its prized warriors into that situation. But I imagine in South Africa or other countries, there, there are people available, uh, maybe in Kenya, maybe in other countries, but there needs to be a, a force of skilled fighters to go in and put down that rebellion once and for all and free those girls and stop this rebellion lest it eats at the heart of Nigeria. We've got some other news that has to do with what you pay at the price at the pump for your gasoline. John. Pat, the price of oil, as you mentioned, and what you pay at the gas pump could fall still lower next year. Goldman Sachs says oil could go as low as $70 a barrel. Oil has fallen sharply in the last few months after hitting nearly $108 midsummer. It's down now to around $80, and that's meant a huge drop, drop in gas prices as well. The average is now $3.04 a gallon, the lowest level in four years. Pat, I recently heard someone say it's like going back in time. Well, if you went back to my time, buddy, it was 26 <laughs> cents a gallon, and they had price wars to bring it down to 21 cents. So to say we can say happy days are here again because it's three bucks a gallon to me. It's a little, you know, <laughs> yippee, it's not $4 a gallon, it's only three. Oh, wow. I'm so happy. Terry. Two cents a gallon. Unbelievable. Well, coming up, two professors from the same college compete for a congressional seat in Virginia. I just know that whoever wins, it's going to be great for Randolph Meekin. For one fall, we're not donkeys and we're not elephants, we're yellow jackets. Meet the contenders when we come back. Tomorrow, the tougher you are, the more respect you gain. From the most wanted list. And I've been running from the law for, for six years. Straight into the slammer. See what finally set him free. Plus, an award-winning coach with a crushing injury. I did shows even though I had uh, the disability. 20 years of pain gone in an instant on the 700 Club. Well, in the 7th Congressional District in the state of Virginia, <clears throat> just north of Richmond, Hanover County and so forth, there was a congressman uh, who happened to be the majority leader of the United States House of Representatives. He was in line to become the Speaker of the House of Representatives, one of the most powerful offices in the land. Even as Senate Majority Leader, he was able to direct huge uh, activity for his district. But the group called the Tea Party decided they were going to get cute. And so in an ill-attended primary, they voted out the Majority Leader of their own party. And they just thought they had done something so absolutely wonderful. So they put in an unknown academic from a little-known college called Randolph-Macon, and his name was Dave Bratt. So now he's running in a general election in a safe Republican district where all of a sudden the Democrat is in a tight battle to possibly win the seat away. And interestingly enough, both candidates are professors from that same small private college in Virginia, a little bit north of Richmond. How interesting and how foolish the Tea Party was and some of the stuff they have done. Jennifer Wishon brings us this story. The 7,000 people who live in Ashland, Virginia, affectionately refer to their town's seven square miles as the center of the universe. And now... Hope you'll vote for me November 4th. Okay. <laughs> They're proclaiming Ashland the center of the political universe. I want to curb Congress's endless spending addiction. Yeah. And that... 
Dave Bratt rocked Washington by knocking Eric Cantor off his perch as House Majority Leader in the primary. He's a professor at Randolph-Macon, a private college nestled in the center of town. November 4th, he'll face Jack Trammell, a Democrat and also a professor at Randolph-Macon. Uh, I'm the sociologist. Uh, Dave, when he gets here, he's the economics yeah. guy. He thought he'd be running against Eric Cantor, and then he turns out running against his colleague. Well, Jack's a nice guy. He works in the disability services wing at the school, does a good job uh, for the kids over there, and we, we, he's worked in, in my classes to help my students. I characterize us as casual friends. Um, we would have debates in the locker room or in the lunchroom um, about various things. The college is named for John Randolph and Nathaniel Macon, congressmen who served more than 200 years ago. Today, administrators couldn't have planned a better lesson for students who are getting an intimate look as their professors battle it out over ideas. They're both wonderful members of our community, uh, and, and that's what characterizes both of them. Since the men got into the race, college provost Bill Franz says school pride is registering a little higher. I sense it among our students. Uh, they walk a little taller. Uh, they're happy to proclaim where they are. All of a sudden, the college of 1,300 students is part of the national conversation. A lot of people are really excited for it. Lots of people come in and buy the t-shirts and they're all really excited to wear them. It's also a bumper year for college Democrat and Republican clubs. The cool factor has definitely risen a little bit. Um, if you're associated with one of the clubs. Trammell says it was his students who convinced him to run. I require my students at Randolph-Macon to complete service learning, and they turned that around on me and said, when is your service learning project going to start? He's selling himself as a candidate determined to remove compromise from the list of dirty words on Capitol Hill. Part of what I intend to do is to demonstrate bipartisanship and an ability to work with people who don't think like I do, but we need to be able to get together and solve problems. Both candidates are men of faith. Trammell teaches Sunday school at his Disciples of Christ Church. Brat is a committed Catholic. They're both academics, but by all accounts, very different. Bratt is an economist who also studied theology, giving him unique credibility when he talks about restoring morality in the budget. Uh, the federal government in particular is just kind of out of control. You just look at Medicare and Medicaid, Social Security, our entitlement programs are insolvent or bankrupt uh, by the, you know, 2030. Virginia 7th is a red congressional district that clearly preferred Romney over Obama in 2012. But both candidates have an edge in that voters have already demonstrated they want a fresh face. Everybody needs to wake up, not just Democrats. Republicans, too, need to wake up. Both men vow to keep their campaigns positive. Voters have heard that before. But in this race, there's a special audience to consider, students. We really want to see them exemplify the best of Macon and, and how they are turning, you know, everyday kids into the leaders of tomorrow. I just know that whoever wins, it's going to be great for Randolph-Macon. Come election night, a professor from Randolph-Macon College will be elected to Congress, and political science majors will have a major connection on Capitol Hill. For one fall, we're not donkeys and we're not elephants, we're yellow jackets. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, Ashland, Virginia. Well, that's politics for you in the Old Dominion. Terry. Beautiful area. Well, up next, a former Tennessee Titan talks about the biggest opponent he's ever faced. He said, Tim, um, I believe that you have ALS. And he said, I'd like you to get another opinion, but I, I believe you have it. First thing that went through your mind was what? Unbelief and just, just, wow. Stay tuned for Tim Shaw's extraordinary story. That's coming up. Hey, this preview, they tell me, is coming up on the 15th of November, which is a couple of weeks from now. And uh, it's for prospective master's, doctoral, and uh, juris doctor law students. And it's an experience the time you come. It's a beautiful campus, a lovely time to be here. And uh, they treat you like royalty, and you really will love it. And 93% of the people who come to visit our campus 
enroll. Enroll, that's awesome. They love it. They sense what's here and they want to be part of it. Well, so we've held the leaves changing until they could get here for November. So yeah, I guarantee the leaves <laughs> will change just for each one of them. So uh, you can go to your phone, call in, and <clears throat> book a place for the preview weekend, November. 1-5 at uh, Regent University. All right. There isn't anything that I know of more awful than what's called Lou Gehrig's disease. Mm. Uh, it's really terrible. Uh, it, it is people, their minds are still in their bodies, but their bodies can hardly function. And uh, uh, they often can only communicate by blinking their eyes. Uh, our health uh, reporter came up with the fact that some of the coconut oil seemed to have a good effect with uh, some of these uh, uh, diseases that come, and I think uh, this would be one of them. So maybe you can rebuild some of your uh, damaged uh, nerve endings. But nevertheless, we've got a man named Tim Shaw. He's a brave former NFL linebacker, and he's a special teams captain. Last Mar uh, March, Tim turned 30 years old, and one month later, at the age of 30, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, known as ALS. Recently, sports reporter Tom Buring talked with the former Tennessee Titan about facing the biggest game changer of all. Here's that interview. Tim Shaw played football the same way he approaches life, devoted and determined. Can't be half in. So either you're in or you're out. And so be all in. The game of football is just, it was just made for me and I was made for it and we, we had a great run. His NFL run ended as a Tennessee Titan after seven years and four teams. As special teams captain, teammates followed his kamikaze lead. It's a dead focus. Nothing will keep me from the football, nothing. Not one guy, not two. And when I get there, I'm gonna disrupt the football. I want to separate that man from the football. I miss it. Tim was cut before the 2013 season. He retired seven months later on his 30th birthday. The following month, issues with his muscles led him to the doctor, where a different, destructive opponent emerged. I was alone. They did a couple tests, and he came back in, and he said, Tim, um, I believe that you have ALS. And he said, I'd like you to get another opinion, but I, I believe you have it. First thing that went through your mind was what? Unbelief. And just, just, wow. I thought about my family and uh, just not, not wanting them to have to go through that. Tim waited four months before sharing it publicly. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It's been survived but ALS slowly but surely takes away your functions and your nerves and your muscles. And ultimately, they shut down. It is, uh, it is very feared, but it is not undefeated. His online announcement came from the Titans headquarters. An ice bucket challenge downpour followed as his brotherhood of former teammates stood behind him. Just such a, an amazing feeling to have those guys stand up with me was awesome. I feel a great sense of responsibility to impact this disease for those struggling with it now or in the future. And like God has really put me here for a purpose. And what, a, what an amazing opportunity it is. Tim was the type of guy that you would tell a young guy to go follow. What he's going through is going to take a ton of mental toughness. And uh, he probably learned a lot from this game. If there's a guy strong enough uh, that can battle this and, and get through it, um, it's Tim. I still miss him, you know, now out on the field. There's just something about him. Tim's workouts slow his muscle loss and deteriorating motor skills. Trying to correct it and focused on going as hard as I can go. And in these early stages of a physical and mental fight, his athletic and competitive pedigree rises. You at some point have to lower your expectation based on where you came from. How do you accept that? That's hard, I mean. Take, take the game of golf, which I love, and the score is not what it used to be, or I don't hit the ball as far as I used to hit it. And as an athlete, it keeps me driving to, to get back to where I used to be, whatever little way I can do every day. Show me how good. Come on, get out there. Show me how good, brother. <laughs> oh, I'll show you. I'll show <laughs> oh, you. he did. 
More importantly, Tim's inner strength helps him handle the tough adjustments and unanswered questions ALS brings. What's most daunting about the uncertainty of what's ahead? Understanding that the odds say that I will one day be laying in a bed, unable to move a muscle, but fully mentally aware. But God has just shown me that he's got it. He's in control. The Bible says that the Lord determines, you know, what's gonna happen to us. I've really come to peace with that. And it's the freedom of, of giving up control. I never had control before a diagnosis. So why would I worry about when I'm gonna die, what's gonna happen to me? All I can do is live today. Tim earned his recognition in stadiums, where it not only brought him notoriety, but it also shaped and sustained his name. But just like his career, well-being, and body, his identity has also been challenged in this transition. I've been Tim, the football player, for a long time. When your identity is one thing and it's taken away, you don't know who you are. So ultimately, I found my identity in being just a, a child of God. Although my identity has shifted, uh, it's really just become more solid. And I, and I know who I am and I know what, that God's created me. And so ALS doesn't define me. His childlike resilience and ironclad strength sustains him for a fight that also requires surrender. We all have unanswered questions. I'm not God. There are some things that we will not understand ever. But I know this, God uses any circumstance and in my life, it's a, it's a mystery, it's a puzzle. It's not what I want, but, it's, but it's, it's mine. It's my privilege to walk this out. Like in footsteps that recently walked in Brazil on a mission trip with his dad, drilling wells in distant places that bring him close, meaningful gestures of love and support. 13-year-old Brazilian girl in the middle of the Amazon jungle telling me that she's been praying for me for three months and that she, she doesn't want anything bad to happen to me. Being prayed on in a church with a no walls in four different languages, that, that is God saying, I love you to the fullest. And I had to bring you all the way out into the middle of the jungle to just show you that. God shifts your perspective that would never be shifted if you didn't step out in that, that uncomfortable space. Tim Shaw, tackler extraordinaire who grips disease as he fights for life while fully living it. And it's that relationship, it's that belief that a God can love you despite every sickness in my body and every sin that I've ever committed, He loves me anyways. And that's what God is to me, man. He wipes my garbage away. He takes my ALS and He holds it in His hand and He says, Tim, I got you. I got you to the fullest. There are so many good things that He's done. Don't, don't curse him in the bad times, he's there. He's there. You talk about triumph, there's nothing that man ever did on the football team to even come close to what he's doing now. Bravery, courage, indomitable will. And we just pray, <clears throat> I know he's, he's resigned to just wasting away, but I'd like to pray for the Lord to touch him. And you pray for this man that God somehow will reach down and, and do whatever is necessary to reverse this dread disease. Because God's able. He can do all yes. things, all things well. Yeah. Okay, the Terry, what's next? has been won there Amen. already. Right. Well, still ahead, we've got your email. John says, my wife and I are in our mid-70s. What's the best place to keep our savings? Pat's going to answer that and more after this. And welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. The number of Islamic extremists is growing rapidly in Germany. The country's domestic intelligence agency estimates some 6,300 people there are members of a fundament fundamentalist strain of Islam known as Salafism. And that number could rise to 7,000 by the end of the year. That's compared to about 3,800 three years ago. Authorities estimate around 450 Salafis have already left Germany to join Islamic groups fighting in Syria and in Iraq. 
People around the world are remembering evangelist Johnny Lee Clary. He was a former imperial wizard of the Ku Klux Klan who experienced a radical conversion to Christianity. Clary died of a heart attack last week at age 55. He said he felt compelled to give his life to the Lord after reading the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. He said, quote, I finally got on my knees and said, God, my life is screwed up. God, I'm in a mess. I need your help. I felt like a new person, brand new creation. I felt like I had a weight lifted off my shoulders. After becoming a Christian, Clary learned how to love and live in unity with all people. He became the first Caucasian elder in the Church of God in Christ, a predominantly African-American denomination. Now remember, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry are back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Tomorrow, the tougher you are, the more respect you gain. From the most wanted list. And I've been running from the law for, for six years. Straight into the slammer. See what finally set him free. Plus, an award-winning coach with a crushing injury. I did shows even though I had the, the disability. 20 years of pain gone in an instant on the 700 Club. To listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. If you're a CBN partner, you're helping us change lives around the world. For instance, in China, two boys who were born deaf and now hear and speak. And it's all because of people like you. Ming and Guy are brothers and the best of friends. They understand each other well because both boys were born deaf. Their parents are deaf too. I worry that my sons would not have any friends and later would not be able to find work. Just the thought of that made me cry. A doctor said their boys needed hearing aids and language training, but the Zas were extremely poor. I could not pay for one hearing aid, let alone two. Since we are deaf, no one will hire us. So for the sake of their sons, the Zuz started begging on the streets. People pointed at us and laughed at us. I was so ashamed. They estimated it would take at least 10 years of begging to collect enough money for hearing aids. Then one day, Mr. Zuz saw something that gave him hope. It was a school with lots of happy children all wearing hearing aids. I met the principal and talked to her about our sons. I was so touched by this couple and their love for their boys. I wanted to do something to help. The principal called CBN. While Mr. and Mrs. Zuz's conditions were too advanced to be treated, we gave both Ming and Gi hearing aids and paid for their language training. I will never forget when my boys put on the hearing aids for the first time. I was so happy, I cried. They have friends now, and they will be able to get jobs when they grow up for sure. We also helped Mr. and Mrs. Za start their own barber shop, so they don't have to beg on the streets anymore. I will work hard to provide a good life for my sons. Thank you so much for your help and your loving heart. You have completely changed all of our lives. Meng and Guy and their parents now have hope and a future. Those boys are going to grow up educated, able to work, and it's all because people like you cared enough to give. If you haven't joined the 700 Club yet, would you join today? It's 65 cents a day, $20 a month, but together, when we all link arms, we really can make a difference. We want to invite you to be a part of that. Our number is toll free if you just call us at 1-800-759-0700 and say you'd like to join the 700 Club. We welcome you to the the outreach of ministries here that literally goes across this country and around the world. And if you'll join using Pledge Express today, that means even more of your gift will go directly into the lives of people like Ming and Guy. That's electronic monthly giving. It means your bank does all the work, saves you lots of hassle. It also saves us some processing costs. So we want to say thank you for using Pledge Express by sending you psalms of encouragement. Pat did this. 
It's really beautifully done. Some of the most encouraging psalms set to beautiful music, and we think it'll bless you in your car, at home, in your quiet time. You can give it as a gift to someone after you've used it, but we know that God will bless you. So call now, make a difference in the lives of others, and we'll send you this right away. All right, hey. time for some emails. All email. right, let's Are get some questions. Well, let's bring it on. Okay, well, the <laughs> first right. one, Pat, comes from... Uh, John and Liz, this is a couple writing. He says, I'm 79, my wife is 75. Considering the financial state of this country and the possibility of an electrical grid failure, is the bank a safe place for our savings and IRAs? We have just under $100,000 between the two of us. Further investing or hiding everything under our mattress seems risky. What are your thoughts? Well, you know, if you got your money in a bank, uh, they are insured. The FDIC, I think, up to about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. If you have one hundred thousand uh, in a good bank, now uh, it's insured. But if the bank fails, mm -hmm. you got no guarantee that you get your money. I, I really believe that. Uh, say you're going to live another ten years. Well, during that period of time, we're going to have some growth in the economy. We may have inflation and so forth, and that's why. I, I really like the, the uh, you know, you put your money in a savings account, you get less than 1% in today's world. Maybe you may even get negative yield in some accounts now. Uh, there are things that are called master limited partnerships. You, you could spread them out. You could get, say, five of them and have $20,000 in each one of them. You could have your own little uh, mutual fund and you'd get dividends. So. Assuming they're paying 6%, that means that you'd be earning $6,000 a year. And uh, if it's 7 or 8%, it'd be even more. And the, the money should grow a little bit in there. You know, I can't guarantee it. Uh, if you're in a savings account, you, theoretically you get your money back dollar for dollar. But if it's, a, it's serious inflation, uh, you lose money. So <clears throat> I, I think... Uh, you, you may need a certain portion that you want ready cash, and you leave that uh, in some kind of a bank account. But they, they're all protected. I wouldn't worry. But, you know, uh, you could get hit by an asteroid. You could have solar flares. You could have uh, volcanic eruptions. You have all kinds of stuff. But we can't spend our lives worrying about stuff like that. We've just got to live our lives. And the Bible says, occupy till I come. So let's get the gospel out and let's get on with life. All right. Okay, this is from David who says, why in the Bible do people live much longer than they do today? Seems like back then people lived twice as long as they do today. Can you explain? Um, I really don't have an explanation. There was some thought and some have posited, and I don't know if that was right or not, that uh, the people who live so very long, the Methuselahs mm -hmm. and people like that lived seven, eight hundred years. Uh, and uh, and apparently until after the flood, there wasn't as much moisture in the air. There weren't as many bacteria and microbes and things like that. Uh, and maybe the climate was such that uh, assaults on our bodies weren't as severe. But after the flood, God said the years of a man is going to be 120 years. So that is where we ought to be shooting for. And uh, uh, if we're not living that long, it's because we're not living healthy lives and we have genetic flaws and there are all kinds of things. But I, I think 100, 110, and that was Joshua was 110. I think that's an attainable lifestyle. And it has to do with your state of mind. It has to do with the way you eat. It has to do with your exercise. It has to do with your just the whole idea of staying alive and enjoying life. If you think you've got to retire at 65, then you're going to get rust out and die. But if you keep active, uh, you can live a lot longer if that's what you want to do. All right. Okay, this is Sandra who says, Recently a friend has come to the Lord and has been studying the Bible. I was so happy for her. Then out of nowhere, she accused all of our friends of being sinners. I hate to say it, but I liked her before she started reading the Bible. She's gotten very judgmental and she feels that everyone around her has some kind of problem. Sounds weird, but she's gotten nasty after being saved. I'm considering saying goodbye to the friendship because she brings up the Bible almost every time we're together, which wouldn't be bad except it usually has has to do with what's wrong with me. Is there a statement that you can tell people who use the Bible to be mean well, to people that will curb their uh, zeal just a little? Very, I'm not the only friend who feels this way. It's very simple. The Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. For the measure that you judge, uh, it will be judged you. So 
The woman is breaking the law. Can I tell you a story? It's an interesting story. There was a man named Harry Luce who was the founder of Time mm -hmm. Magazine, Time Life. And uh, he married a girl uh, who became uh, Mrs. Luce, and her name was Claire Booth. She was a writer, and then Claire Booth Luce. And along the way, she became a Catholic. She had been a nothing or a Protestant. Now she's a Catholic, and she was a very, very active Catholic. And the joke is, she was in Rome talking to the Pope. And they heard the Pope say, but Mrs. Luce, I already am a Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> these people can get a little overbearing. <laughs> All right, so much for the stories. <laughs> and for evangelism. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, that's all the time we have for email. Coming up, a woman with an open wound that miraculously closed. You're going to see how this former nurse was supernaturally healed. Plus, we want to pray for you and for your needs, so don't go away. We'll be back. Done there this night. Well, we want you to be in shape. We want you to be healthy. We continue to have a great response to our Protect Your Health series, and it's not too late to request your free DVD. It includes all five of the segments on healthy living, and that's top notch advice from experts. If you'd like to get your free copy, all you have to do is call the number on your screen. There it is 1 800 759 0700. Just say, I'd like the Protect Your Health DVD series. We want you to stay healthy this season, so call now. Your DVD is free. Okay, time to pray. Or I guess we're going to yeah, throw to this piece yeah. first. Well, um, Nani Sue Wright says that she went through the ringer. The retired nurse broke her neck, and she spent the next few months in bed. That's where she developed sores the size of grapefruits, and they wouldn't heal until the day that she happened to watch the 700 Club. On August 31st, 2011, I was at my back door throwing food out to my birds. And my foot slipped and I fell down a flight of steps. I was rushed to the hospital. I was in a coma. And they told me that I'd never walk again, never come home again. I was also on life support. During my time of recovery, I developed bed sores multiple bed sores on my body. The main one was on my backside, on my coccyx bone. And I had some on my heels, and it was very excruciating pain. Then I came home a year later, and I had wound care nurses coming three times a week and dressing it, and it was still very painful. And I watched 700 Club every morning, and I was watching one morning, and Pat Robinson said, there's a lady in our audience that has a bed sore. They're open sores. Somebody has open sores. It may be the kind of bed sore you've been lying so long. God is healing you of these conditions right now. And I raised my hand and said, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I accept it. And my wound care nurse came that day, and she said, I told her, I said, it's healed. Honey, it's healed. A couple days later, she said, do you know it's scabbed over? And then about three days later, she said, I have some good news and some bad news for you. I said, tell me the good news first. <laughs> and she said, the scab is gone. Now tell me the bad news. And she said, I can't come and see you anymore. It's just been such an awesome experience, knowing that God meets every need in my life every day. And he has just blessed me so much. He knows your need. What an amazing story. Well, here's another great one, Pat. This is Jimmy. It's a woman in Pinehurst, Texas, who developed chronic headaches. Every day at noon, she'd get a headache that wouldn't go away until she went to bed at night. Then one day while watching this program, Jimmy heard you, Pat, give a word of knowledge. You said you have terrible headaches. You are being healed. She said immediately the pain lifted, and she has never had a headache since then. Well, here's one. This is Dean in Boring, Oregon. You didn't know Dean, did you? I don't know Dean. I don't think you did. <laughs> Dean developed problems with his esophagus. He had difficulty swallowing and could often choke on food. The one that, right after she had an attack, she was watching the 700 Club, and Terry said, quote, 
someone is having a lot of trouble with your esophagus. You didn't know Dean or his esophagus. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. But God knew. Dean coughed and the throat cleared, and since then he's had absolutely no incident of choking. Okay, folks, we're going to pray for you now. What do you need? God knows your need. God knows who you are. He knows where you live, and he knows all the suffering that you've been going through. Terry and I are going to join hands, and we're going to believe together for you. And I want you to receive an answer right now. Father, I join with my sister in Christ, and we pray together right now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, may healing come into your body. Somebody has uh, an ulcer. You've got pain. You're, you're in agony right now uh, in the very center of your uh, being. You just feel this pain in your intestines and in your stomach. In the name of Jesus, that pain is going. We cast it forth in Jesus' name. Terry, what do you have? Someone else has a newborn baby girl with some uh, developmental issues and, and physically, and God is healing that for you. That child's going to live and live well and healthily. There's somebody named Marsha, and you, you've got, uh, in the old days, it used to be called palsy. You, you're, you're shaking. Uh, I don't know if it's, you know, one of those uh, diseases that people have, but whatever it is, that shaking is stopping. You're going to be absolutely healed. Marsha, you walk and raise your hands, praise God, and receive an answer. Terry, what else you Someone have? else has been told you you're going to need a tracheotomy. It's not going to happen. God's going to heal your condition. And someone else, you have an issue with pain going up and down your spine on either side. God's healing your back condition right now in Jesus' name. And, and I believe it's Mary, you, you've got a lump in your breast right now. You're worried about it. It's cancer. It's not cancerous. Um, it's a benign cyst. But just put your hand on it. It'll go away in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we leave you with today's power minute from Psalm 91. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Well, that's all the time we've got tomorrow. See how a woman is supernaturally healed after a crushing spinal injury. So if you need prayer, our prayer counselors are on the telephones uh, all across this land, and they're there 24 hours a day. So just call in. In the meantime, for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson, and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.